Oh, I can put it right there, maybe. It's not like it's stuck. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good. You said that to me. Okay. All right, I think we're good. Can you close the lines just a little bit? You have to twist the thing. <laughs> You know how many times I've got all these facilities? Set them here for easy access to everyone. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll just sit up there and eat them all um, the whole time. I was on time for work today. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. I haven't got a chance this time. I'm going to get some cookies. I'm on new. Okay, so I'm, I'm kind of excited about uh, this lecture today because I pulled a little practical joke on everybody. <laughs> Who read my practical joke? Oh, good. You're all reading it. Wow, fantastic. And how many people fit on the date? Right? What do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? Bit on the bait. How did you think it was real? I did. I, you know what? I was kind of like iffy because I'm like, okay, it's April Fool's Day. Yes. I forgot that it was No, that was my first thought. Okay, it's April Fool's Day. But then when I read it, I'm like, okay, I can't wait to get there so I can see what he's talking about. My girlfriend said, well, I was thinking, I'm like. Oh, I wonder if he's gonna be there. You know, because you didn't say where, where was you know what school. Yeah, I did that on purpose, so I would not get in trouble. You know, so it was like a joke. You know, right? If any of my schools came to budget, say it's about the sister, and say it was about you. Right. So I'm like, now I get there tomorrow and it's right. a sub or something. Then. You're <laughs> no, but I was uh, curious. Like, Oh, I'm sure your grade would only go up, right? You uh, right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no. um, that was um. I wasn't thinking about all the people that wasn't in the class anymore. I'm like, when did they get on there and write something about? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Why would they do that? Yeah. Well, we're gonna talk a little bit about this tonight. So that was that was an April Fool's joke, but it's also um, as I responded to two emails, it's gonna be the substance for tonight's lecture. So we had some fun and hopefully you'll remember that you're being goofy doing an April Fool's prank but also it's actual subject matter for tonight's lecture so it should be a little bit more fun than usual um, and to you know to remind you of where I come up with uh, the subject matter I pull it from real life and apparently somebody on the website of Ray my professor doesn't like that I do that so if you'd all prefer that I got non real life you know events I guess I could please you, but I'm sticking to my guns. I'm going with real life subject matter. I was working out and I was walking around the track and I came across the site and um, so I clicked on it. It's a bad idea. And um, there's a lot of negative comments about me. It's, it kind of made me sad. They're uh, very, very negative. And I, I took a little offense at first, but then you know me, I don't just take offense and think, all oh, those jerks. I'm thinking, okay, why did, why is this happening? What caused this social phenomenon that people would come after me? I'm a pretty nice guy, and whoever finishes the class probably gets an A. So why is anybody coming after me? Like, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, I'm not, I buy you cookies, um, I don't <laughs> slash your tires. You know, I don't call you names, and you get good grace. So what what part of the social contract vocabulary term, am I not living up to? Uh, so I read the comments. What part of the social contract am I not living up to? Well, the quotes in the April Fool's joke were actually true. Uh, one of the students was upset that all they learned how to do was write a 12-page research paper. Uh, well, kind of that's my goal. So goal accomplished, but the student didn't like it. And um, you know, would not recommend, didn't learn anything about sociology. 
which I think is hard because all I do is stand up here all, every week and go, here's a vocab term. Here's another vocab term, isn't it? Okay, uh, don't buy the book. Well, uh, that saves you money. I thought I was doing you a favor, but apparently students want to buy $100 books. So. But as we've learned in this class, you can't just base truths off of small samples. So after reading the comments and thinking about some of the things that I've heard, some qualitative data that I've heard um, in talking to students, I've done observation you know, of the students that I've had over the years, and with the students I've talked to, most of them really liked me, and I keep in contact with students after the semester. And as I indicated to you, I've even gone and had a beer with like seven students. And I don't think they're the ones that were hating on me on the, on the internet. So I think that what happens is on the Rate Your Professors website, I, I really believe that, you know, I know some of you probably can't stand me and you'll go post comments, some of you here. But I think that the majority of the people that post the comments are not people that finish the class, that come to class, that do the work, that go home taking something uh, from the course. I don't think the students that post negative comments learn anything because I don't think that they actually come to class and, I mean, I'm just, I'm peppering you with sociology so I don't, if you can't read the book, I mean, that's another issue. Um, so I just don't think that the sample is representative of the overall real response of the students. Now, what is a way that I could figure out if my hypothesis was true, okay? Um, so my hypothesis is, hey, these terrible comments, I don't think that they're really accurate. In other words, I don't think that I get an F grade, maybe a B minus, I don't know, maybe a C, but not an F. So how could I figure out if my hypothesis was correct, that this was a, a bad sample? that it didn't really represent the overall population of my students as a whole. How could I do that? I could do my own survey. So I've already talked about my own participant observation. I've observed students actually talking about me. Like, I'll come in, I'll hear people talking about me. Uh, I'll hear people talking about me out in the hall. And students will have their own one-to-one -one conversations. We could do another survey, right? Maybe like a pre and a post assessment too. Like, sure. Like, you know, like give you like a pre assessment. Like, what do you think you're gonna learn in this class? How do you feel about me? How do you feel about the material? And then afterwards, what did you learn? Have we met our goals? Right. Sort of set myself up for success because what I say is you're gonna learn how to do a 12-page research paper. At the end, I'll say, did you learn how to do a 12-page research paper? And if you say yes, I feel I've done my job. As opposed to the student posting the comment that says. I learned how to do a 12-page research paper. That's totally not why I came to school. I came to school for another reason, which I don't know what it would be. And um, another thing about doing a pre and post is I would be able to survey the people that were still there at the end. Right. With the Rayer professor, I noticed that the most recent post was from March. And that means that the student has not finished the semester. So either someone, it's somebody in here that jumped the gun and says, I hate Girdwood already. I'm, I'm going to keep going to class, but I still hate him, and I'm, I hate him so much I'm going to post. Or it's somebody that dropped a class. And I don't think that they got the full experience of the class, so they're only giving half of um, the response. And so a pre and post would post, uh, get data on the people that were still there at the end, right? With radio professor, you have no idea. You don't even know if these people are even in the class. And another one, I saw some trends in the way the comments were written in the way that certain capitalized words were <laughs> expressed. So I believe it's the same person repeatedly putting in the same comment and taking the numbers down. Now, I don't care too much about My feelings are hurt, but I don't care too much about this because as my uh, April Fool's joke indicated, right, I really can't get fired over rate my professor rate, no matter how bad they are. Why can't I get fired over rate my professor rate? Why not? I mean, but who really knows if the person that's rating you even took your class? They could be. It could be invalid, right? Yeah. So who has the 
who has the power to post comments? Anybody. Anybody. And who has the power to fire me? Delta. So does Delta put their reliance on anybody? They want some more valid data so they conduct their own survey, right? So I tell you, I'm trying to teach you to be active researchers because I don't really put that much confidence in the research that's already been done. So you all say, Girdwood, I have not been able to find an article that shows me the answer to my question. Well, good. Find the answer yourself. Delta looks at me and goes, is he good or not good? Well, somebody's already done a survey, ratemyprofessor.com. But they might look at that and go, that's, that's junk. We got to do our own survey. So what do they do to survey you? They do those um, end of the market area surveys that they have to be learned that one of those <laughs> feedback, <laughs> forms. Feedback, <laughs> feedback forms. Feedback forms. Official feedback forms. And that's how they may fire me or not is the feedback forms because they administer the survey. And so if you want to really trash me, do it on this. And that may not even be just totally accurate. I mean, because at the end of the semester, you're so ready to get out of here. you like, okay, okay, okay. You know, you don't even fill out the, you know how they have the questions on the back. Half the time, you don't even fill that out, you know. So those may not be completely accurate either. And some people probably think that I'm going to look at these afterwards and so they give me good grades so that I don't give them a bad grade. <laughs> you know, they're making out this bargaining. That's a game theory, okay, a game theory that you might be doing. And the truth is I don't. Somebody here, who's taking them? Who gave them the, you're going to take them now, right? Okay, so, um, or you both can. Take cookies so with you, too. Oh, no, no, no. She's going to take them down for me. So I won't actually look at them. Whereas, Ray, my professor, I look at but there is one thing that you have pretty good anonymity on Ray Professor. You can trash me, I'll never know who it was, right? Mm -hmm. So what is the difference in this versus Rate My Professor? What's the main difference? Can anyone give me the main difference? I'll teach you the vocab terms later. Somebody I email the vocab terms. But what's the main difference? How can you define the difference? Just kind of wrap it all up. What's the big difference? Well, I feel like the same. But theoretically, the sample could be the same. You know, in theory, even though the person put it out mid March, maybe it was you. <laughs> you know, it could be. Maybe the, maybe the sample is the same, although it is lower, right? What else? You wrap it up? I'll give you the vocab term then. This is formal. This is formal. And ratemyprofessor.com is informal. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit more about formal and informal power here on the slideshow. And I want to mention one more thing before I get started on the slides. So I have my own experience, okay, with bad comments. But that's just me. I'm not the only one that gets bad comments, okay? Who, and you know my interests, who in your interests or in mine do you think catches a lot of anonymous flack from the public? From, yeah, celebrities. The president. Yeah, the president, who's kind of a celebrity. So you don't go for celebrity. Well, <laughs> we'll not go that far. But the ironic thing was, um, I'm going around the track, working out, thinking about me. Then I get on the bike and I start riding the bike. And you know I follow Twitter. And you know I study basketball. So this is after Michigan State had lost their basketball game. And you know the kids, they, they light the couches on fire and all this stuff. But I'm reading Twitter and there are Michigan State basketball fans who are bashing the team. Okay. <laughs> So they will get, there'll be a newspaper article. You probably read a newspaper article online. You ever read a newspaper article online? Yeah. Ever? You go to Bay City Times, you go online, M Live, whatever. There's a comment section. So there'll be a newspaper article, Michigan State loses to Duke. And there's comments that say, this guy is the worst. They, they'll even go by name. 
and this is some of the Twitter things I was reading. Alex Gauna, basketball player from Michigan State. He's so terrible, he should not even be on the team. You need to kick him off the team. He's the one that lost us the entire tournament. And it was not just one guy, it's a bunch of guys. Why do people do this? Why, why would anyone who calls himself a Michigan State basketball fan get on the internet and just hate, hate the basketball players? Why do they do that? Get attention. <clears throat> they get attention, but they're kind of a not, well, I guess on Twitter, their face is out there, so they could be getting attention. Why else would they do this? Do oh, so they copy people's behavior. So they get done with the game, and they watch by themselves on the couch, and then they're like, Hey, we lost. I thought it was probably Keith Appling that lost this game. Let me check Twitter. Everybody's gawking down. I'm going to retweet these because I'm, I'm going to be like everybody else. I'm going to get more followers because if people agree with me, I'm going to start getting more followers. I'm just going to keep spitting this hate and this hate. What, what other reason might somebody post a negative comment um, online? Maybe they have bad money on the game. Like, just pissed off. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, that's a good point. So they had they have betting money, yeah. and now they're angry because somebody, Alex Gauna, part of the Michigan State basketball team, took their money. And so logically in their head they're thinking, Gauna, he owes me something. He lost the game. He owes me money. But nobody the, knows who they are. Nobody knows who they, and they they can't go get money from. Alex Gauna. That's not possible, right? This is the problem that they're facing. They just lost a hundred dollars, right? And they're like, uh, if he had made that basket, yeah. So he owes me, but I, he doesn't even know me. So I'm gonna try to get attention, and I can't go get money from him. In fact, I can't even see Alex Gauna. Um, and that's like the commenters on rate my professor is. Here you have a formalized way to get me fired. If you all wanted to organize and give me 20... And then the, 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 the dog have your name on them? Uh, they they have your name on them. They would. Whoever take them in, throw them up. It's got to have my name on it. No, your name, but they don't have the student's name on them. Correct. They're anonymous. Okay. But if, this is how Delta would fire me. You all band together, give me Fs, I'm fired. This is how you do it. So that's where your power lies. So if you give me bad comments right now, right, you tear me to shreds, and then it turns out I'm not fired, you didn't get your way. So what are you going to do? Because don't you try to find other ways to bad, or to, um, bad me, mean you somewhere else? Yes. So you you tried the formalized power. didn't work. You're going to go to the informal power. And still not get your way. So what these fans, they wanted to win. They want their money. They didn't win, so they lost formally, which was the game. They have to go informal. And it's it's unfortunate, and we'll talk about the, the foundation, the system of it. But if, okay, if Alex Gauna should not be on the team, what's going to happen to him if he's not good? Who's going to, Coach Izzo, get, kick him off the team? But that's not happening. If I'm really that bad of a professor, what's going to happen to me? I will get fired if I'm that bad. So there is a formal structure of power, and then there is an informal structure of power. We're going to talk a little bit about which is stronger, which is better. And it's an interesting paradox because, you know me, I love public stuff. I love you all to have power. I want you to have more power than me. But at the same time, if those students were listening to my message, they would know, great, my professor will not get you. <laughs> I'm trying to teach you how to, to, to take over the world, right, or get what you want. If you really want to knock me, get me fired. Here, right here. This is it. <laughs> so listen to my lesson. That's it. If you're going to organize, do it the formal way. If you want Alex gone off the basketball team, don't be tweeting that he sucks. It's going to do nothing. <laughs> Call up Izzo, request a one-to-one -one meeting, and then see if you can get him off the team. And you probably won't because it's on, yeah, which <laughs> you'd be calling me. 
so that's that speaks volumes of who's post. You said crazy people. Yeah, that speaks volumes of who's posting to read my professor. Right. I understand it. I get it. I don't even know nothing about it. That's why I'm a professor. Well, go tear me to shreds if you want to go. Feel free. And I probably got myself in trouble because I said I mentioned it last semester. I go, oh, you know what this thing is? I just learned about rate my professor. I showed it. Oh, look at all my ratings. They were all good. Next semester, trashed. Oh, oh man. Uh, it, only, it hurts me psychologically, but I still have a job. Everybody needs a Mm-hmm. Well, I'm just not stressed with them. They might not do anything, but they just want to stay up. Now, let me, OK. So let me respond to that because I thought about that. You know, people want to express themselves, right? But who's posting to rate my professor? Why? So we all have places that you get. But, in, but also the negativity. Yeah. Yes, all the places. They all could the stand outside my classroom and yell at me if they wanted to. Or tell you. <laughs> I mean, what can you do? Kick them out of class because they say, I don't like you. Yeah, I'd probably say, come to the front. Have you. Right. Tell, tell everybody what you think. It seems like you um, had a legitimate reason for not liking they would go to yeah, right. exactly. well, they go to a website that you don't even know who running the website. Is it a real website? You know. But they want to hear have a voice. But let me let me I gotta this is what I'm still trying to figure out because I've figured a lot of stuff out. I'm gonna show you my slides. But what I haven't figured out so much is why do all the haters go to the Twitter and to the comments? Like we'll leave this class. Ten of you will love me. Five of you will hate me. Who's going to post the comments? The haters. So it's like I look at Alex Gana's Twitter feed. There's 200 haters and like five guys that say, hey, good, good job. I know you lost, but I love you anyways. So why is it always, why is it always the haters? Because it's on social media. It's worldwide. And everybody gets the see. Everybody gets the Why is it the haters? Is it the repetitive thing? There's been studies on this. Like. Somebody's going to hate, and then that's going to snowball. So it's, did the hate start with the game loss? And then it's just like, hate, mm -hmm. hate, 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 hate. So people can't delight in a game loss like me when I was in high school. I'd be like, we tried. <laughs> I'd be like, let's go get root beer floats. I really did that. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I said they probably have money on the game, and they pissed off because they lost their money. But if they thought like me, they just go home and they go, yeah, I lost 100 bucks, but at least I have a car that runs. Right. And I don't have to sleep in my Jeep anymore. And I have two legs. All right. Like, gosh, people got to hate all the time. Ugh. OK, <laughs> the power of online comments. Not so many of the slides will be about online comments, but you heard my um, setup spiel. But unlike the commenter who feels they're not learning sociology and just thinks that I talk about myself all the time, they fell asleep after the first half hour. I do talk about myself a lot. It personalizes me. <laughs> you know I'm a real person with feelings. This is Prezi. Has anyone used Prezi before? Pretty cool, isn't it? It's all 3D. P R E Z I dot com. Prezi. And it you can it's free. And you can make a presentation that looks like this. Take it in. Do your final presentation to your professor and knock their socks off. It's pretty cool. The power of online comments. <clears throat> Certain ways that you can have power overall in the world, right? Formal and informal power are the themes of this presentation. The setup, as I've already talked about, formal and informal power. These are types of power that people can have on Earth. They're the first. Five that came to my mind with two subcategories, and I was reading when I came up with these, so half of them may be original, half of them not. Do you understand these methods of power? You have military and incarceration. So if uh, somebody didn't like me as a professor, they could get me in jail, right? <laughs> and if I was in jail, I would not be up here anymore. Because I think that's the ultimate goal. They want me fired. That's my assumption. They hate me so much. Alex Gauna, they don't like him on the team. They want him kicked off. They can't get him kicked off. What else could they do? Put him in jail somehow. I don't know. But most people can't do that, right? But that is a way to, for power. On an individual level, a student could put me in jail or a 
fan could put Alice Gowan in jail, that's on an individual level, a micro level. What can we do on, I would say we, because we're not going to do it, but what can people do on a macro scale as far as military and incarceration to enforce their power? Micro scale, she puts me in jail. Macro scale, what happens? Do we just choose random people to put in jail? We've talked about this before. What are the incarceration rates for African Americans? Over 50%. It, I think it's in the 80s. So if a student hates on me, they can try to put me in jail. If a group in power hates on another group, they can use incarceration from a mass scale to incarcerate that group. And if you think that it's random or bad luck or choice that 80 plus percent of African Americans are incarcerated and not 50 percent or their ratio in America, then you're mistaken. And you probably hate on me after this lesson of girls crazy liberal, whatever. This is a way on a macro level that one group can control another group. They can incarcerate them. And it, it still exists to this day with the incarceration rate of African Americans. Military is another obvious power, right? So if America does not like North Korea, we'll go and invade them and we will set up shop. We did that in Iraq and Afghanistan recently. So that is a way of power. We can basically tell them what to do now, obey us. You know? Whether that's right or wrong, that is a method of power. Money is a method of power. We talked about the gambling thing. But what is? Uh, how do you use money for power? It's pretty easy, right? Give me an example. I'll give you this much money. <laughs> yes. If you just do this, we can control somebody. Here's Twenty dollars, be a nurse for one hour. That's power. You're controlling somebody's life with money. You know, like here's ten dollars, go mow my lawn. You are dominating that person's life for the period of time that they are mowing the lawn. So you're exchanging money for a part of someone's life. That's very common. Right? And of course, you can buy stuff. You, know? you could buy a jail. Money is a type of resource. Other resources like oil and food. How would we use oil as a resource to control someone and enforce our power? What do they do? Raise the prices per barrel, which results in more illegal And they can raise their prices because they control it, right? So resources are up here because you can use it like money. If you had all the money in the world, you just control it. Resources are a little bit more important because money, you know, we could all gather together and go, hey, look, money doesn't mean anything. Dollar bills mean nothing. If we all gather together and organize, we could eliminate money if we tried really hard. But we can't really eliminate oil, right? It'd be like, we have to blow the world up. So those people that have oil, they just control it, and then they can price fix. The same is true with food. Um, if you own... Uh, all of the sugar, 90% in the sugar um, in production, you could price fix the sugar. And I don't think many people know this. It shows up in a video that I've <laughs> screened in other classes. Um, did you know that the government gives commodities to certain sugar companies, like Domino Sugar, and that it would be virtually impossible for any other person to try to start a sugar company in America. There are sugar fields in other countries, like South America or whatever, but the United States government does not allow that sugar to be imported into America. Why? Because Domino is an American company. So there is no free trade. So you could have a sugar field in Mexico, make all kinds of sugar, 
and then try to get it to the border and be like, I'm going to sell all the sugar for like 50 cents a bag. And you, the border people would say, no, we got, a, we got plenty of sugar. We're selling it for 100 bucks a bag over here. It's produced by Domino. Not only does Domino produce sugar, but it's subsidized. Does anybody know what that means? Yeah, where does the government get money? Taxes. So you're all paying for a controlled market. And this is not a conspiracy theory or anything. This is just like the fact. <laughs> you're all paying taxes to control the sugar production that in turn price fixes it so that it is hundreds of times what you would pay if the borders were open. If the guy could bring his sugar over from Mexico, all of our coke would cost uh, five cents a glass. But it costs a dollar a glass because your own taxes support the price fixing of the Domino Sugar Company. So that's another one that's not up here. Borders. That's a way to control stuff. And borders can border in food and oil. Votes. We talked about votes, right? It's like a popularity thing. If you, if you vote somebody in... If you nominate someone or elect somebody to lead you, you give them power. And knowledge, knowledge is power, right? I give you <laughs> I give you the knowledge that you can all oh, just get me fired. So like if you know that and how that you do, you do have the power. If you didn't know that, or if I withheld those from you, you would not have that power. What other types of knowledge is power? Anything? Yeah, can you give me an example? I've got one. Can you give me an example? Even like fixing your car. I paid $400 for the people to look at my car and not do anything. If I knew how to fix it, I would have saved myself money. I know, it sucks, but I didn't have the knowledge that your husband was a mechanic. My dad, I did not have the social connection. That's another form of power. <clears throat> and I was thinking of uh, StubHub. I know how to get Pistons tickets front row for 30 bucks. Other people pay $150, but because I know that, I can save myself money. So I have this sort of power. Now remember our themes again, formal and informal power. Which type of power carries more weight? We can talk about rate your professor, and we can talk about these, but we don't we can't we don't have the ability to say which is more powerful unless we can measure it. Okay, we need to be able to measure power. So you can say money is super powerful, and I'll say having oil is super powerful, and then we'll just go back home and we'd be like, I don't know who really won that argument. We would have to be able to measure it. So if you were doing an arm wrestle, you know, one arm would be oil, one would be money. Whoever won, that's right. So we measure it, okay? We have to have ways to measure each type of power. So to do that, what I've done is I've divided power into three forms of capital. Okay? Capital is a way to measure things. Um, capital gains are financial gains. Uh, capital is often looked at in financial terms. Financial capital means you have money. Okay. There are different types of capital though, according to sociology textbooks and theories. Cultural capital, social capital, and economic capital. Money is what type of capital? Yes, economic. Popularity is what type of capital? So then we can start talking about is money more important than popularity? And we can talk about it in terms of units if we can measure it in social capital and economic capital. And then there's cultural capital. We'll get to that. Last. That's when we can really drive home the formal and formal. <laughs> Economic, cultural, and social capital are ways to measure power. <clears throat>
Which is more powerful, cash or credit? These are two types of financial capital, right? You can have cash, you can have credit. Sometimes they're equivalent. Uh, I have a credit card, not really, it's a debit card. But if you go to the coffee shop and you buy $5 of coffee, you pay cash, how much does it cost? Uh, $5. And if you go to the same coffee shop, not one of those crazy gas stations that change the law, and you pay with a credit card, how much does it cost? Yeah, but just for, the regular $5. $5. Okay, so if we did that story, cash or credit, which is more powerful, neither. They're equal, right? $5 cup of coffee, $5 cup of coffee. Cash is 5 bucks. credit is 5 bucks. Okay? Yeah, cash don't charge the interest. Yeah, so now we're starting to talk about how they're different. And also, and I think this one will really get through to you, which one of these is more powerful? Let me hear from you first before I tell you my thought. People who are running the credit card companies, they're obviously getting more money from the legal fees or interest. But cash is more powerful. So the companies are pretty powerful. <clears throat> what are, What are your other thoughts? The company has the power, but they up your limit. Say that loud. If you don't have any credit, you can't get a loan for a house. Credit's really powerful because my car that I just bought used. $10,500. I know Delta pays me a lot of money, right? 1200 bucks a semester. So if I work here for 10 years, I could probably afford to pay cash. But I can't. I don't have $10,500 in my back pocket. What do I have to do? Find it. What? I get some credit because if I have bad credit, they will not sell me that car on payments. So I have decent credit. So credit allowed me to do what? Get a car. Yeah, get a car. So now we're talking about when we go to the store and we get something like coffee, it's equal. But if somebody has good credit, they can get a house or a car. So in that situation, potentially credit more powerful? Well, if you use credit instead of cash and that goes to your credit. Then you build it, right? Yeah, so then in that case, I would probably How, when is cash more powerful? I mean, I could, I could probably, with my credit score, not that I would, because I like my living situation, I could probably buy a $500,000 house. Oh, that's scary to think about. We need a $500,000 house. We would have some parties. Let me tell you. <laughs> I could probably get a $500,000 house. I do not have anywhere close, I don't even have even anywhere close to $10,000 in the bank. But I, I could get a five hundred thousand dollar house. Could you get a five hundred thousand dollar house? Could you? Could you? Could you? Huh. So why do I have all this power? Yeah, but why me? I don't do anything. I work I like three thousand dollars in the bank. I have not done anything. I have, I'm in debt, ninety thousand dollars. For student loans, ten thousand dollars for a car. So why can't I buy a half million dollar house and you guys can't? But I do. I don't do anything. You'll establish yourself. Establish myself. Yeah. I have phony power. You have good standings with the people that has money that can give you the money. Is that a good system? I mean, it is. I, I just told you, if I had a $500,000 house, I would throw some big parties. You would charge to get in the party. <laughs> she might build an orphanage. Or then you're making money. <laughs> she it's might not, build an orphanage. That's why we're all in cash. Yeah. It's like, well, why the government's millions of dollars with that? Billions. And that's exactly it. Because why are we in so much debt? I mean, from a basic sociological standpoint. <laughs> Don't get into detail with finance. But why are we in debt? Be because we are, it's in our culture, like I just said, if you buy on credit, you will have more stuff. I will buy a $500,000 house. Then I'll throw parties. That's great. So it's just incentivized credit. So if you do that, like the haters, comments, 
You see, we buy a $500,000 house, you'll establish credit. You'll buy a $500,000 house. You'll buy a $500,000 house because you want to keep up and be just like me. Then all of a sudden, the whole country is this in debt. Because we've normalized. And now we've got a bunch of foreclosed $500,000 houses. Yeah, because we normalized that behavior. Sociological vocab term, normalized. We've normalized the behavior of getting in debt. So more powerful on a micro scale, $5 cup of coffee, it's a wash. More powerful on a mid-level scale, me versus you, credit, because I can buy a lot of stuff. And then on a macro scale, even more powerful in a negative way, credit, because we're in debt, which could lead to wars. Cash, cash doesn't have too much power. Unless if you wanted to buy an ounce of weed, which one? Cash. Cash. Much more powerful. <laughs> Surprised you answered that so quickly without any hesitation. No. If I say weed, I'm supposed to say marijuana. Okay. What demographic group has more access to the strongest type of power? Thinking about the last slide, I can buy a half million dollar house. Okay? You can, you can, you can, and you can. Why can I? Because I'm older, so that's one. And you're a middle-aged white guy. Isn't that who has the most credit? So I'll go on and on about the incarceration rate and say, oh, you know, we got to fix this because 85% of black men are in jail. That's a big problem. And then somebody else would say, Girdwood, you know that's true, but you know what the bigger problem is? is the middle-aged white guy can buy $500,000 houses when the middle-aged black guy is using cash to buy weed and then goes to jail. Okay, These are systems that are set up potentially marginalized groups. Okay, So the strongest type of power who has access to it in an economic sense, generalize, say it's the middle-aged white guy. Is it, can any, does anyone feel that that's incorrect? Because if you did, you could definitely do a study on it and try to discredit that. I'd be more than willing to listen to this stuff. I'm not a liberal, crazy left-wing nut. I'm just throwing stuff out there kind of to elicit responses. They must be much right. I mean, I tried to get a car loan, and it basically said I didn't have enough credit history, mm -hmm. which at my age, obviously, I'm not going to have much credit history. Mm -hmm. So, what, I guess, like, the older you get, the more history you have, so it's easier to get, like, the most stuff, whereas it's only my age, and it's not. And another thing, I knew the guy that was selling me the car, so I had a social network. It's our next slide, right? Social capital. I built them. So I actually have an age capital. This is an actual way to look at things. And uh, social capital, knowing the guy that sold me the car. Okay, so he know where to go where to put them in how to lose eggs to get that car. Sure. And I have I have more of a social way. network capital because if say oh I don't know, say I had a fifty thousand dollar hospital bill or something like that, I could probably call on my friends to help me fix that. I, I have not really done that, but I could have done that. Like, I have enough social connections that had anything drastic happen in my life, if it happened to my friend, maybe they'd be totally screwed. If it happened to me, I'm, I could probably fix myself because of my friends. I'd call up my family and just be like, come on, I don't want to mess my credit up, so help me out. So I have a social network. The higher income you are, the more chance you have. The lower income, like I told you last week, I have hospitals that I'll never be able to pay off. But if somebody who had, you know, was better off than I am, they probably have to pay off. If you don't pay. So another thing to think about as we move into social and cultural capital, but next to social capital, we talk about credit in financial terms. What's another way that you can have credit? in the form of social capital. Oh, the right people. Yeah, but give me the give me the phrase. 
What type of credit could you have? Would you say? Yeah, come on, give me the catchphrase, right? It's a type of social capital, and it's not financial credit. So it's not what you know is what you know. <laughs> what what other type of credit could I have that's not monetary? Street yes, street credit is not financial. Street credit is what? Social capital. Street cred is social capital. So if you guys like things that stick, you know, I'm teaching you sociology all the time, regardless of the, what the haters say. Street cred is social capital. These are concepts that you can take from this class. You go, a year from now, somebody says, what do you learn in sociology? You go, I learned that credit is an interesting concept that can be based on money, but also street cred. You can cash your chips in because that can be measured as social capital. Social capital analysis. Which of these has more social power? 100 wealthy friends or 1 million poor friends? Give me some examples. We just talked about economic financial capital, wealth, money. Now we're talking about social capital. So if you have 100 rich friends, if you have a million poor friends, Give me a scenario when one of those would beat the other one. The poor stick together. Who's going to win, though? That's the question. Who has more social power? The rich. How's them millions can take them out. The people can take them out. <laughs> 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 The wealthy? Because they can make. So we've got a disagreement. This is good. We got to we got to resolve this. We got a million hungry poor people and then hundred wealthy people. We're gonna take that hundred wealthy people out and take what they got. That's why you have so many people taking from people. You're gonna come at them with guns and just kill them. <laughs> well, those wealthy people could buy other people like their support and stuff, so they could. The but what you're going to buy is some of my people, and they're going to work with you, but we're going to all work against you. <laughs> yeah, but we're going to put them on your team so they can be on the inside. And she's going to give them money and Cadillacs and Hummers and yeah, okay. Corvettes. But what and about the, that? They're going to get over there, and they're going to be like, uh, thank you. I want to keep this right. house. You gave me a house because she's rich. And all you guys are dirty, smelly, stinky, have no laundry. But they're still friends. They're still friends, but <laughs> she just gave me a million dollar house. You think I'm going to go back to the hood but and go? But the poor people can relate. They can relate. They're going to give up. Like a social. So they're going to give up their million dollar house. She just gave me a million dollar house and a Hummer. And I'm going to come back to my friends and go, I can relate to you. <laughs> Is that really going to happen? Well, maybe they can introduce each other. Or maybe I can. I can help you now. We all gonna come up. You think so? I mean, it, I guess it depends on who it is and how, what the relationship is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Those people are, they're going to be like, oh, maybe I'll bring a couple of my four friends to a little uh, they'll be like, okay, let's go back to the property. Even though they give you the stuff. Right, you know, I mean, forward. so you can just tell me if you get it, you just gonna say, screw y'all, I mean, go over there and eat your beatles and your spam, and we're gonna go get us some ribeyes and T-bones. Like, if, you, <laughs> if you're looking for somebody to help you pay off your bills, you probably more likely to have, if your people who are in poverty are more likely to help you with some of your both of them are the ones who have the money to help you. But yeah, they're the ones they won't help you. So you realize that this is actually happening today. Like this is not just a crazy yeah, right. right thing. It is. Like we, he, Bill Gates has like a fifty billion dollars, and the Apple guy mm -hmm. put him. In, we could get a million people and take over their castles <laughs> and they get their sweet cars, but we don't do it because they gave us a $30,000 house to live in and we're trying to keep that so tight. We gotta come to Delta College so we can keep our $50,000 houses. <laughs> you know, we're, we're down, oh, give me some cookies and Cheetos, you know? And 
And I'm going to eat that. <laughs> oh, you didn't want cheese. It's... <laughs> so this is not happening. So I would argue so much against this possibility because I would say, look, it's happening right now, and these people are just looking up at these castles. You hear about the 99% and the 1%. We're just looking, oh, hey, rich people. Good yeah. people like Bill Gates for him, though. Well, we could take them over. We could get guns. We all have guns. I mean, I don't really, but like, there's a lot of guns in the hood. Mm -hmm. Saginaw could just all of a sudden, like, you know, we got a lot of guns, and in the suburbs, there are a lot of million dollar houses. Why don't we just go get them? But they don't do it. I'm not saying do it. Please don't. I live in the suburbs. <laughs> but it doesn't happen. Hmm. Why not? They don't go just take over their house, but they will go and take from them, though. <laughs> well, mean, most often than not, it's urban to urban crime. Yeah, that's killing. But that, and I that's mean, what I'm saying. That's one form of power. That's back to the, the original right, thing. But we're talking about you got a million dollars, I got one dollar. I will take some of your money and go back to the hood, and you go back to the suburb, file your claim, or whatever, you know. It, that happens. I mean, yeah, yeah there's a lot of black on black killing. You think that but blacks, you don't, I mean. I don't think there's much Robin Hood going on. I don't think there is. It's, it, it, it's a lot. You think so? I think we're all, I think nowadays America's so I think that yeah. if you get it, you're going to keep it for yourself. It's like the lottery where she kept her bridge card and the money. Mm -hmm. That uh, ODB did that. I give him a lot of credit. Mm -hmm. he, he put it all on TV. R.I.P. <laughs> put it on, on TV. R.I.P. Okay. We talked about social capital. We talked about economic capital. Our last one of this group is cultural capital. Prestige and status. Tell me what this means. We talked about this before. So I'm hoping you can just remind me what these what do these mean? These are uh, titles. What's that? Titles. Titles. Which one is more of a title? Uh, status. Stats. How so? Because it has um, different definitions. Of so she says that titles represent status. Give me an example. Sure, president. If the president came in here, we would do whatever he said. Even so much, we'd do whatever is, whatever those guys are called in the black suits. We do whatever they said too, because he's the president, so he has all that kind of power. That's a status. What other types of status that we've talked in here about even last week? Titles that we talked about last week in our movie that we watched. Types of titles. CEO. CEO. We talked about medical titles. I guess our medical people might, might not be here. Doctor. Yes. Doctors, nurses, LPNs, and home health aides are all different titles of different statuses. So a doctor, most of the time, tells the nurse what to do. And these are status titles. Status is exemplified through titles. And the status and the title is representative of what? Yes, the education. But now we're missing, what, what's prestige? It's not titles and it's not status. So what's prestige? Would it be like, what you like, prestigious? Yeah, yeah, yes. So you've done something great. So you're prestigious. You score a lot. You're prestigious. You're a good dunker. You're prestigious. You're not the president of the team. So I mean, that's like a status you could have. A starter and a bench warmer, those are statuses. But if you just are a good player and you're known as being a good passer, that's a type of prestige. So remember what uh, the what this presentation is based on what are our two things that we're talking about? 
the, the two things that I talked about, the types of power. Oh, formal. formal. Right. Which one of these is formal which one is informal? Correct. So status is formal, prestige is informal. Tell me why. Because it's organized. Exactly. Which one's organized? Um, status. And how does what does that mean to be organized? It has its different categories. And it's put together. It's formally to just use the word. It's formally put together. It's how do you become a doctor? Somebody just come in and say you're a doctor? No, what do you have to do to become a doctor? Go to school. You don't just go to uh, Saginaw High School, right? Where do you go? An accredited college for how many years? And then at the end you get what? Yeah, that's very fun. The, the words are on paper. You went to a specific location. You follow the exact program. It's very organized. It's very formal. But if you want to get prestige, that's the coolest guy in school. How do, you, how do you get that? You don't go to a program to be the coolest guy in school, right? That's like, that's like a good doctor. Like, if you be a doctor, that's your status. Yeah, you perform well and you build a reputation. Believe it or not, reputation is a sociological concept. Okay, you build up, uh, you said something? You're a good doctor. Oh, you said uh, something about being well liked. If you're a popular doctor, if people like you a lot, then you become a well known doctor. Okay? You be a good doctor, a well liked doctor. That's your prestige. So this one's more formal, that one's more informal. So we got to think about which one's more powerful. Is it more powerful to just be a doctor with a degree or to be a really good? Healthcare worker and well known. Kind of formal. It varies. The CEO of Bay Regional Medical Center. What is she? She's a nurse. So how did? What is their, her stat? What is her high status? Title. What is her high status title? CEO. CEO. So that's prestige then, right? She must have had prestige because, don't shoot me, but she's just a nurse. She's not a doctor. She didn't go up through the ranks to become a CEO. But she don't love it. Somehow she got some type of prestige. That's, oh, that, that lady is a super smart, good nurse. Mm -hmm. And she can also run things well. Because just having nursing skills doesn't make you CEO. You could do some sweet sutures. Just having nursing skills will make you a good nurse. That, so you have to kind of have <laughs> So when we're talking about the haters online, to go back to that, what, what are they trying to hate on with me or Alex Gauna of these two things? Prestige. prestige. Exactly. If you knock me super hard on these today, mm -hmm. what will I lose? But also what? Status. because I'll get fired. If you're throwing arrows on an online forum, am I going to get fired? No. So what am I not, what are you not doing? And you're not being very formal and you're not hurt, hurting my status. Status and formal go together. You're trying to hurt my prestige that somebody's going to Google it and go, Gerwood must suck because all these kids think that he's crazy. So you're trying to hurt my prestige in a informal way. Okay. Same thing with the basketball player Alex Gauna. No matter how many commenters say that he sucks, they, they can't take his status away. He's going to be on the team. They're just trying to get people to hate him. Okay, informal prestige. We talked about these. What is a type of prestige that people can get informally? A reputation. You got a good reputation. That's informal prestige. And that's some sort of credit as well. Yeah, yes. And then you can talk about, okay, 
he is a, a real good basketball coach, but he's shady. So it's like, which one are you going to hire? The one that won a lot, but is also shady? Or the one that's like a real good do-gooder, but he only wins half the time? So then you have to measure that in your hiring. Do you base your hiring on reputation or wins? Wins are formal, reputation is informal. Persuasiveness, that's uh, informal power. How persuasive are you? Um, let me give you an example. I sit at the leadership table for my organization. We're a multi-million dollar company and I sit at the table with our 10 leaders, okay? I don't make Jack there. And my, I'm like the bottom of the rung as far as like job titles. I'm like basically janitor status, okay? But I sit at the leadership table. And they go around and the big shots sit at the end and they say, blah, blah, blah. Here's my big idea, you know? And then it gets to the point where I just go, hey, this is what we need to do. And we got to do this. And um, I think you need to call this person. You need to draft a plan. And by the end of this meeting, in 15 minutes, this is what I want. They listen to me. It's crazy. So what don't I have? Status. I don't have any formal status. I don't have financial capital. And I don't have job title. But somehow, some way, I have persuasiveness, which gives me a lot of what at my job? Prestige. Street smarts, we talked a little about street cred. It's another form of informal prestige. And popularity. Sometimes we got to remember that these go together. I'm persuasive at the table, maybe because of my delivery, but also maybe because at the table of 10, the leaders know that like, everybody loves me at my job. Good thing there's no right here, me and my job .com. <laughs> Because I'm pretty popular. So if I'm popular, a lot of people like me, like some of the previous slides, a million people, a million people like me. Maybe that gives me the first place. Yeah. So we got to put them all together because this is the problem with why people don't read Wolf. One of the main problems, not the problem. They don't, nobody's listening to anybody. There's a million people, there's no charismatic leader. That's another book, yeah. But charismatic leader. You've got a million disorganized people. And so that million poor people, they're never going to go and take Bill Gates' money if they don't have somebody that just goes, hey, you all like me, right? Let's go. Let's go take it over. So there's no charismatic leader. So nobody's super popular amongst the poor people, and nobody's super persuasive amongst the poor people that I know of. Who's the, mo who's the most persuasive? person amongst the most impoverished people. This is one of the problems. Who who are the most persuasive people for those in poverty right now? Generally speaking, and you won't be one. Just give me some examples. Who's a persuasive person among people in poverty? You have no idea? Who could persuade? We're all pretty much in poverty. Who could persuade us? People money. Money, but they're not popular. Who are you looking for? Like a billionaire could come in here, maybe without his money. I mean, if they had his money, probably could be persuasive. Singers or rappers or entertainers. I think so. I think the most persuasive people are entertainers. I think if like, uh, I think if like some. Little Wayne came in here and told you all to leave the class. You probably would. It's pretty persuasive. And you look how organized um, entertainers are. Entertainers can get a lot of people together, right? Entertainers can get people to go to a show. That's organization. And that's being popular. Somehow, <laughs> an entertainer, if I put on a show right now in the auditorium or whatever, I would I would get fifteen people. If Little Wayne put on a, a show right now, yeah. So, so that is a measure of his power, of his prestige, is the number of people that will gather, that will organize. So again, back to the million people that won't revolt. 
There's no organization. It drives me crazy. Think of somebody like Little Wayne that can get 50,000 people together, but so they're organized, but they're not going to do anything. Because they're like me, they just drink beer and just go, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> And that, it really, that really, though, that upsets me because everybody's just, everybody's just going to be kept in order. Nobody organizes to revolt anymore. We're just all going to be the same forever. Well, not really. Do they have a choice? How so? Yeah. It's not like Lil Wayne just became popular by the hood. Like, he had to do something to get out there. But his story, he's kind of born into it. I mean, yes, he did have to work hard, but... Well, I mean, any popular person had to work hard to get to where they're at. They had to do something. They had to establish themselves in the world. So then when they get there, when they have that power, this is the 100 versus a million. Once he gets to be part of that 100, what does he do for the million? Nothing. That's our whole system. <clears throat> the whole credit. This is another part of the credit problem thing. <clears throat> you finally get this is the argument we're having. Like, little Wayne comes from one million, goes up to one hundred. You think he brings up nine hundred people with nine hundred thousand people? No. And that's a problem. I mean, but okay. is it a problem or am I wrong? I don't know. You. I mean, you're probably right to a certain degree, but. You can't save the world. You could. If you had enough people. You could. You know. You could. Well, and then you have people that don't want to be helped. You know. Well, they can go. Uh, we could probably incarcerate them. Yeah, so I'm, I'm well, sure it's the people who give them the power. Who gives who power? Like. We give them power. We give little Wayne power? Yeah. We show up at their concert. And we give Bill Gates power. We buy his computers. And we participate on Donald Trump's show. So. But you said that we have choice. Do you really think people are born going, I'm going to work to make little Wayne rich. That's what I want to do. That's not true, right? We don't. It's not what they want to do, but they didn't work hard enough to get where he's at. It's like, not that it doesn't matter how hard you work, though. Like, there's, like, if I want to be a doctor, there's no way I could pay to go through school. You know, a doctor. Then you have to pay Yeah, sometimes you just, I hate to say, we're born into a certain category where you, unless something unforeseen really happens, you're not going to be able to get out of it. I think if you really wanted to, that's okay for your You could organize, though. So you can't be a doctor, but if you wanted to get something, you could rally up enough people that we could change the laws that you could pr practice medicine. Yeah, but if you if you organized enough people, you could actually run for president and then change the law that says I'm a vet. I am running for president. But you're not gonna get elected. No, but I read for my name and it's you don't have enough social capital to become elected. Okay, so back to the slides because they're almost done. And after, I will be wrapping up within 15 minutes and then I'll play the rest of the movie. And that'll be it all. But I do want to wrap this up before everything leaves your brain. This is a great discussion. Formal status, again, is rank based on title. So this is a great one military rank. You're a sergeant, you're a general, these are all titles. In the military, it's a very hierarchical, organized, formal structure based on status degree in education we've talked about. Um, but with degree in education, we can get an informal prestige in there, right? So I have a bachelor's degree and you have a bachelor's degree. And give me an example of the difference in prestige, but make it up. Or we both have PhDs. That we both have formal PhDs. Now tell me a difference in prestige. Let's make one up. I've talked about it all semester. We both have PhDs. That's a formal status equivalent. Now give me an example of a difference in prestige. One might be more higher up, like their personality or what they do. 
Keep going, keep going. Which school you got your PhD? Exactly. So you got your PhD, no offense, from the University of Phoenix, and I got mine from Harvard. <laughs> right? So we're both doctors. Okay. Who's gonna get hired at the doctor factory? Right, because why? I have more prestige in the Harvard versus University of Phoenix. So you guys understand? You can have a formal status of education with the PhD. You can have a difference in informal prestige in where you went to school. Licensure is also, as we mentioned, a formal status. Licensure, you can think of nursing, LPN, CNN. Distinction is a book by Pierre, I always mess it up, Bordeaux. And if you're interested in furthering your summer reading, um, I give you a lot of great books to read. Bowling Alone by uh, Robert Putnam. Who's Your City by Richard Florida. But now if you want to get into the more sociological realm, Distinction by Pierre Bourdieu. It's not that long of a book. It's like one of these paperbacks like that. <clears throat> so the, uh, the essence of distinction is there are fields in which a person can use his power and the power measured as capital, as we've discussed. The, well, one of the main, focus, the main focus of this slide is fields. So the capital is only valuable in certain public fields. Can somebody explain to me what that means? Exactly. That's exactly right. So you go to school for 12 years and you become the best surgeon in the world. And you break down on the side of the road where there's no cell phone service. You're screwed. <laughs> and somebody comes along with uh, a pistol and takes your car. Because, well, he's also a mechanic. <laughs> And so your, your doc, your MD is no good against a pistol. It's no good against a broken down car. So your capital, either formal or informal, is only valuable depending on the field that it is used in. The example was great that you gave. It fits right into my slide. Your status is only good in a certain place that you're in that it's valuable. A PhD is work, worthless working at McDonald's. If I had a PhD and I try to, and I've done this before, I try to go get hired as a waiter after I got my bachelor's degree, mm -hmm. nobody would hire me. So you're overqualified? Well, I'm just like, I don't even know if they said that. They just wouldn't hire me because I didn't have experience. Because the oh. capital on the resume of the waiter uh -huh. is waiting experience. So a bachelor's degree or a PhD or whatever is not going to help you get a waiter job. A PhD would not help me get on the basketball team. A credit card is useless if there's no credit card machine. If you're trying to get some water in the desert where there's no machines, your credit, you could have a million dollars on your MX Black, you're not going to get water. If you're super strong, if you have some physical strength, physical power, muscles will not help you take a math test. Money, as we said, won't stop a bullet. If you're the prom queen, you're just another student in my class or just another nurse. Where you were super prestigious when you were the prom queen, you were the most popular student in your school, and you come to college and all of a sudden you struggle in your class or whatever. It does nothing. I know what it's like to be like popular in high school. <laughs> Take the class with my friend who's a teacher, and all of a sudden I got an A in the AP class because I had that social capital. And then I got into Michigan State, and I sat in a class of 750 people, and the professor could care less who I was. All of a sudden, I wasn't a prom queen, but uh, I just became just another student. A prom queen becomes just another nurse. And so that is what distinction this is not literally what it's about, but it's about the fields, the public spheres of, of your social capital only being um, important or valuable in those fields.
So to get it back to the regular professor, the social capital of voicing a negative opinion about me is that powerful in the field, public sphere of RateYourProfessor.com. It's not really that powerful if you post 12 comments on Rate Your Professor. If you voice the exact same comment on this form negatively, is this more powerful? Yes. So it's the same thing that I'm talking about here to tie it all the way full, full circle. For those haters for Alex Gauna on the Twitter sphere, they can throw comments all day long on Twitter. But if Tom Izzo's son doesn't like Alex Gauna, maybe he's off the team next year. If you spit all these hateful comments about me on Ray or Professor, nothing will happen to me. If you spit negative comments on these forums, I'm like, get fired. So you have to use your power and status in a place where it will be affected. And that is the point of that slide. And the point of a lot of this presentation. <clears throat> what happens, we talk later, why people post comments? Why are these haters on the comment sections online? What happens when a person with little power in one place finds more power in a different place? So this person probably put a negative comment on this form, nothing happened. He goes and he says, I can get a lot of power by tarnishing the prestige and reputation of Europe online. He finds that place, that new field or public sphere, he uses it. So like we talked about Alex Gauna, the fan goes to the game and boos him as much as he can, goes back home, John is still on the team. So he goes to another field, Twitter, and uses that power. Finding and using the power at hand. When someone has no money, what does he do? He tries to
So how could I figure out if my hypothesis was correct that this was a, a bad sample, that it didn't really represent the overall population of my students as a whole? How could I do that? I could do my own survey. So I've already talked about my own participant observation. I've observed students actually talking about me. Like I'll come in, I'll hear people talking about me. Uh, I'll hear people talking about me out in the hall. And students will have their own one-to-one -one conversations. We could do another survey, right? Say like a, maybe like a pre and a post-assessment too. Like, sure. Like, you're saying, you know, like give you like a pre-assessment. Like what do you think you're going to learn in this class? How do you feel about me? Have we met our goals? Right. Sort of set myself up for success because what I say is you're going to learn how to do a 12 page research paper. At the end, I'll say, Did you learn how to do a 12 page research paper? And if you say yes, I feel I've done my job. As opposed to the student posting the comment that says, I learned how to do a 12 page research paper. That's totally not why I came to school. I came to school for another reason, which I don't know what it would be. And um, another thing about doing a pre and post is I would be able to survey the people that were still there at the end. Okay. With the Rayer professor, I noticed that the most recent post was from March. And that means that the student has not finished the semester. So either someone, it's somebody in here that jumped the gun and says, I hate Gerdwood already. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to keep going to class, but I still hate him. And I'm, I hate him so much, I'm going to post. Or it's somebody that dropped a class. And I don't think that they got the full experience of the class. My first thought, okay, okay, this is April Fool's Day, but then when I read it, I'm like, yeah. okay, I can't wait to get there so I can see what he's talking about. My girlfriend said, well, I was thinking, I'm like, oh, I wonder if he's going to be there. You know, because you didn't say where, where was, you know, what school. Yeah, I did that on purpose, so uh, not get in trouble. You know, so it was like a joke, you know. Right. If any of my schools came and said, why'd you say this about this? I said, I didn't say it was about you. Right. Anonymous. I'm like, now if I get there tomorrow and it's right, a sub said. or something, then you're a <laughs> No. <laughs> but I was uh, curious. Like, what? Oh, I'm sure your grade would only go up, right? You were, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so no. The, um, that was, um, I wasn't thinking about all the people that wasn't in the class anymore. I'm like, what did they get on there and write something about? Yeah, right? Yeah. Why would they do that? Yeah. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about this tonight. So that was that was an April Fool's joke, but it's also, um, as I responded to two emails, it's going to be the substance for tonight's lecture. So we had some fun, and hopefully you'll remember that Gerber being goofy, doing an April Fool's prank, but also it's actual subject matter for tonight's lecture. So it should be a little bit more fun than usual. Um, and to, you know, to remind you of where I come up with uh, the subject matter, I pull it from real life. And apparently somebody on the website, uh, Ray, my professor, doesn't like that that I do that. So if you'd all prefer that I got non-real life you know, events, I guess I could please you. But I'm sticking to my guns. I'm going with real life subject matter. I was working out, and I was off of small samples. So after reading the comments and thinking about some of the things that I've heard, some qualitative data that I've heard um, in talking to students, I've done observation you know, of the students that I've had over the years. And with the students I've talked to, most of them really liked me. And I keep in contact with students after the semester. And as I indicated to you, I've even gone and had a beer with like seven students. And I don't think they're the ones that were hating on me on the, on the internet. So I think that what happens is on the Rate Your Professor's website, I, I really believe that, you know, I know some of you probably can't stand me and you'll go post comments, some of you here. But I think that the majority of the people that post the comments are not people that finish the class, that come to class, that do the work, that go home taking something uh, from the course. I don't think the students that post negative comments learn anything because I don't think that they actually come to class and I mean I'm just I'm peppering you with sociology so I don't if you can't read the book I mean that's another issue um, so I just don't think that the sample is representative of the overall 
real response of the students. Now, what is a way that I could figure out if my hypothesis was true, okay? Um, so my hypothesis is, hey, these terrible comments, I don't think that they're really accurate. In other words, I don't think that I get an F grade Maybe a B minus, I don't know, maybe a C, but not an F walking around the track. And I came across the site, and um, so I clicked on it. Bad idea. And um, there's a lot of negative comments about me. It's, it kind of made me sad. They're uh, very, very negative. And I, I took a little offense at first, but then, you know me, I don't just take offense and think, oh, those jerks. I'm thinking, OK. Why did, why is this happen? What caused this social phenomenon that people would come after me? I'm a pretty nice guy and whoever finishes the class probably gets an A. So why is anybody coming after me? Like it doesn't make any sense. I mean, I'm not I buy you cookies, um, I don't slash your tires, you know, I don't call you names and you get good grades. So what what part of the social contract vocabulary term? Am I not living up to? Uh, so I read the comments. What part of the social contract am I not living up to? Well, the quotes in the April Fool's joke were actually true. Uh, one of the students was upset that all they learned how to do was write a 12-page research paper. Uh, well, kind of that's my goal. So goal accomplished, but the student didn't like it. And, um, you know, would not recommend, didn't learn anything about sociology. Which I think is hard because all I do is stand up here all, every week and go, here's a vocab term, here's another vocab term, this and that. Okay, uh, don't buy the book. Well, uh, that saves you money. I thought I was doing you a favor, but apparently students want to buy $100 books. So. But as we've learned in this class, you can't just base truths. Oh, I can put it right there, maybe. It's not looks like it's a talk. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good. You said that to me. Okay. All right, I think we're good. Can you close the lines just a little bit? You have to twist the thing. <laughs> You know how many times I thought I'd almost spill these? <laughs> Set them here for easy access to everyone. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll just sit up there and eat them all um, the whole time. I was on time for work today. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. I haven't got a chance to stop the wire and get some cookies. I'm on new. Okay, so I'm, I'm kind of excited about uh, this lecture today because I pulled a little practical joke on everybody. <laughs> Who read my practical joke? Oh, good. You're all reading. Wow, fantastic. And how many people fit on the date? Right? What do you mean? Put him, submit it somewhere. Push me a bit on the base. How did you think it was real? I did. I, you know what? I was kind of like iffy because I'm like, okay, it's April Fool's Day. Yes. I forgot that it was April Fool's Day. No, that was.